Welcome back now to the second chapter, to the second letter to the church of Thessalonica. This is going to be a power-packed, in-depth discussion and study as we read about what the Lord is saying to us today about the great apostasy that's been going on and yet in greater fashion is upon us and coming around the bend. But nonetheless, let's let the Word of God speak for Himself as this is the revelation of God's heart to mortal men such as you and I, that we may grow today in grace by the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Let us pray again before heading into this second chapter of Second Thessalonians. Father God, we just thank you for the privilege to be here today. I just ask, humbly yet boldly as your son, that you would open all of our hearts, minds, souls, and give us strength to comprehend what you are saying, and to endure, and to have understanding which is to turn from evil, and to fear you, and to be wise. Please give us wisdom, and strengthen our souls and hearts to be obedient children, and walk in love, in light, in truth. All in Christ Jesus' mighty name and being, we praise you, Father. Amen. Here we are now. Verse 1 of chapter 2 states, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come on unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow, and amen. Verse 13 now, to close, states, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, Stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen. This concludes chapter 2 to 2 Thessalonians, and we see many deep, deep, riveting, compact truths in the 17 verses here. Let us dive in a little bit deeper as we receive what the original text is saying through just a couple Greek wordings. But even before that, I want us to touch on the last two verses again. For, for it states this, Now may our Lord, 16 and 17, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and, and our God and Father who has loved us and given us, given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. 
comfort your hearts, and establish you in every good word and work. We know grace comes through faith, and we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Those can be referenced in Ephesians and Romans right there. But nonetheless, we see God's word through God's spirit evolving around us that we would evolve around God. Now, what that means is revolving, I should say, not evolving, forgive me, but revolving around us right now as we're in his word so we can revolve around God through his son, Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, too, that for salvation, this is because of God from the beginning chose us through sanctification, which is by the truth and by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called us by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we picking up on the truth theme here? We are told to be patient and hold fast, but why God is doing his work. See, only God can do the work of redemption, of justifying us before himself. That's why Jesus died on the cross on our behalf. Only God can sanctify us, like it says here in verse 13, through his spirit and belief in the truth. It comes through the word and by the word, and Christ is that word. We find that very clearly in the Gospel of John chapter 1, as well as Revelation chapter 19. It states, the one on the white horse who is faithful and true, he had another name, which is the word of God. We cannot, cannot, overlook or bypass this word, this blessed, beloved word of truth, and which has the power of sanctification, because Jesus also in John 17 prays and sanctifies himself through the word of God and truth on his own behalf, on the 12 disciples' behalf there with him, or sorry, the 11 disciples' behalf there with him, because he knew and already declared prior that the one who was designed and designated for perdition, which was Judas Iscariot, we know this, and yet forth going on, he discerns and and by being holy and having the Spirit of God showing him the things ahead, prays for you and me. Prays for the believers that will believe upon the truth through the word of his disciples and his apostles. And this is one of those words right here in 2 Thessalonians through his apostle Paul. And he's speaking to us. And Jesus prayed in John 17 that we, we as well, would be sanctified through the same truth. The same truth. And that, my friends, here and now is this word of God before us. Amen. Now let us dive into the Greek wordings here for the second chapter of Second Thessalonians. First is going to be falling away as contexted in verse 3. Verse 3 again states, let no one deceive you by any means. Let's repeat it again. Let no one, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless, unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So, falling away comes first. Falling away in Greek is apostasia, apostasia. And it states this as the Greek word number 646 in the Strong's Concordance, but it, it goes in to say this in the Vine's definition, being the meaning here is a falling away from the faith. The word is used twice in the New Testament. The nation of Israel fell into repeated backslidings, Jeremiah 5.6. The prophet Jeremiah predicted the judgment of God upon such disloyalty. Your own wickedness will correct you. And your backslidings will rebuke you, states Jeremiah in chapter 2, verse 19. In the New Testament, apostasy is generally defined as the determined, willful rejection of Christ and his teachings by a Christian believer. That's cited in John 15, 22, Hebrews 10, verses 26 through 29, and many other passages as well. This is different from false belief or error, which is the result of ignorance. The day of Christ will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, we just read this. And then he goes on to say in this definitive uh, uh, truth to the word of falling away, apostasia, this, some teach that falling away is impossible for those persons who have truly accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord. And I'll back that up real quick, that if the salvation is true, if the effect of the effectual love of God is, 
is working in our hearts and souls as he has chosen us. As in verse 13, where it says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. He says, Because he has chosen you from before the beginning to salvation. He has chosen us from before the beginning to be saved. And this can raise several questions into the sovereignty of God. But we need to be firm and steadfast in the foundation of God's word, dividing it as good workmen of God's truth, knowing what we know because God declares it. We don't listen to what this says or that says or what he says or what she says, but what God says has the final standing because heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word remains eternal. So we see the falling away, this apostasia mentioned here and throughout all the scriptures in the Hebrew and in the Greek, in the Old and in the New, we come to receive and understand that this is a reality. But if God's love is truly worked in a heart, I believe full-heartedly that God produces that love, that God produces that faith, that God moves us in such a way as He uses His people to pray and intercede, and He Himself is interceding as He sent Christ to intercede to pay the debt for our sins by shedding his blood and dying by laying his life down upon the cross and then taking it back that we may live and be fully alive in abundance with him. Amen? Amen. Now we're going into verse 8 to another Greek word titled lawless. And this word in the Greek for lawless is animos. Animos. And this is Greek number 459, for those of us who are curious to where that could be located in the Strong's Concordance. Greek number 459 is animos for lawless. And the Greek word animos literally means, quote unquote, without law. Thus, the phrase here in this verse, the lawless one, is depicting the man of rebellion just as Christ embodies righteousness, so the lawless one will embody rebellion against God's, against God's righteous law. The figure is probably the same person described by John as the Antichrist. 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3, and the beast, Revelation 13, 1, with his open defiance of the sovereign ruler of the universe. This man is the embodiment of evil and the great opponent of Christ and his kingdom. Amen. So, we get deep text here in chapter 2 when dealing with these two Greek contexts of apostasia and animos, of falling away in lawlessness and being lawless. We know that we will be held firm in the truth of God's word because this is the importance here. This is Paul making a plea And not just a plea, but a firm declaration and standing tall and honored to be God's apostle, declaring that the truth of God cannot be shaken. And those who remain in God will not, will not be deceived. Because if we're not careful, the elect will be deceived as it is written. But yet nonetheless, Paul says we have a job to do. In verse 3, he says, let no one deceive you by any means. We have to stand guard, and we have to guard our hearts, my brothers and sisters, my friends and family. For now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, this is the second advent. This is what many refer to as the rapture, but we must know that Christ is who He says He is. Tribulation is in all of our lives, and we are walking through suffering to become more like Jesus. But He says, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For you, this is important. We will not be shaken in mind or troubled by spirit, by word, or by letter if we remain in the true spirit, the one spirit, the one word, the one letter, the one God, the one Lord, the one baptism, the one truth that renews our minds and transform our heart, transforms our hearts, the word of God. This is how we remain steadfast and will not be shaken. So praise God for these truths. 
Let us grow in grace through the knowledge of Christ here today, my friends, because God is worthy and his true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. I love you guys. I pray that you continue to grow, to continue to remain steadfast in remaining in this word that God has used to sanctify us, is using to sanctify us and to grow us. Let us be encouraged to grow in faith, to grow in love, to grow in hope, to grow in grace. For we need all the above. Peace, grace, and mercy be with all of you in Christ Jesus. We'll see you around the bend in the third chapter, Lord willing. Until then, Amen.